I never believed in ghosts. Not really. Sure, I'd get spooked by a good horror movie or jump at an unexpected noise in the dark, but I always chalked it up to an overactive imagination. That changed last summer when I took a job that led me to the old Hartley house at the end of Willow Street. Now, I'm not sure what I believe anymore, but I know one thing for certain, evil exists, and sometimes it finds a home in the most unexpected places. It started innocently enough. I'm a 23-year-old architecture student, and I was thrilled to land a summer internship with a local historical preservation society. My first major assignment was to survey and document the Hartley House, a decrepit Victorian mansion that had stood abandoned for decades. The plan was to assess its condition and determine if restoration was feasible. The house had a reputation, of course. Every small town has that one creepy old building that's the subject of endless rumors and dares. Kids would dare each other to spend the night there, but no one ever did. Not really. There were whispers about the Hartley family, how they'd all died mysteriously over a century ago, how the house had stood empty ever since. But I didn't put much stock in ghost stories and urban legends. My first visit to the house was on a sweltering July afternoon. The taxi dropped me off at the end of the overgrown driveway, and I remember thinking the place looked like something out of a gothic novel. Three stories of weathered brick and warped wood, with a tower on one side and a wraparound porch thick with vines. Most of the windows were boarded up, but I could see hints of stained glass behind the boards on the upper floors. As I approached the front door, key in hand, I felt a strange reluctance. It was like walking through molasses, each step harder than the last. I chalked it up to nerves and the oppressive heat. When I finally reached the porch, the wood creaked ominously under my feet. The key stuck in the lock at first, but with a bit of jiggling it turned. The door swung open with a groan that seemed to echo through the entire house. The smell hit me first, musty and thick, with an underlying sweetness that reminded me of overripe fruit. I stepped inside, my shoes leaving prints in the thick layer of dust on the floor. The entry hall was grand, even in its state of decay. A sweeping staircase dominated the space, its once elegant banister now warped and splintered. Faded wallpaper peeled from the walls in long strips, revealing glimpses of bare plaster beneath. To my left and right, open doorways led to what I assumed were the parlor and dining room. I spent that first day taking measurements and photos scribbling notes about structural integrity and potential restoration challenges. It was tedious work, but I found myself oddly fascinated by the house. Every room seemed to hold whispers of its former glory. Ornate moldings, fragments of expensive wallpaper, the occasional glint of tarnished brass. It wasn't until I reached the second floor that things started to feel... off. I was in what appeared to be a child's bedroom, documenting the remains of a once cheerful nursery. Faded circus animals still danced across one wall, their painted eyes seeming to follow me as I moved around the room. I was crouched down, examining the base of an old rocking horse, when I heard it, the clear, unmistakable sound of a child's laughter. I froze my heart suddenly pounding. The sound had come from somewhere above me, muffled but distinct. I held my breath, straining to hear more, but the house had fallen silent once again. Hello? I called out, my voice sounding small in the empty room. No response. I told myself it must have come from outside. Maybe some kids playing in a neighboring yard. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. The sound had been too close, too clear. I finished my work in that room quickly, trying to shake off the unease that had settled over me. 
As I stepped back into the hallway, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. There, in the thick dust coating the floorboards, was a set of small footprints. They led from the room I'd just left to the base of the attic stairs at the end of the hall. Child-sized footprints. Fresh ones. I stared at them for a long moment, my mind racing to find a logical explanation. Had some neighborhood kid snuck in while I was working, but I would have heard the front door open and besides, these prints seemed to appear out of nowhere. There was no dust disturbed leading up to them. Against my better judgment, I followed the prints to the attic stairs. They went up a few steps before disappearing. The attic wasn't on my survey list for the day, but I knew I wouldn't be able to rest if I didn't check it out. The stairs creaked with every step, the sound impossibly loud in the silent house. At the top was a heavy wooden door, warped with age. It took some effort, but I managed to push it open. The attic was a cavernous space, the sloped ceiling creating deep shadows in the corners. Dust motes danced in the few rays of sunlight that managed to pierce the grime-covered windows. The air was thick and stifling, carrying that same sickly sweet odor I'd noticed downstairs, but stronger here. I swept my flashlight across the room taking in piles of forgotten furniture and stacks of mildewed boxes. Nothing seemed out of place or recently disturbed. I was about to turn back when my light caught something that made my heart skip a beat. In the far corner of the attic, partially hidden behind an old wardrobe, was a rocking chair. And it was moving. Slowly. Steadily. As if someone had just vacated it. I stood rooted to the spot, unable to look away from the gently swaying chair. The creaking of its runners seemed to grow louder drowning out the sound of my own ragged breathing. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, the movement stopped. The silence that followed was deafening. I don't know how long I stood there, flashlight trained on that corner before, I finally managed to back out of the attic. I practically flew down the stairs, my earlier skepticism completely forgotten in the face of blind panic. I didn't stop running until I was out of the house and halfway down the overgrown driveway. Only then did I pause to catch my breath, hands on my knees as I gulped in the warm summer air. When I finally looked back at the house, I saw something that nearly stopped my heart. There in a second floor window was a face, a child's face pale and solemn staring down at me. Our eyes met for the briefest moment before the figure melted away into the shadows. I'd like to say that was the end of it, that I quit the internship, told the historical society to demolish the place and never looked back. But that's not what happened, because the thing is, I went back again and again over the next few weeks. Each time something inexplicable would happen, objects moving on their own, doors slamming shut, the sound of footsteps when I knew I was alone. But instead of driving me away, these occurrences only fueled my obsession with the house and its secrets. I threw myself into researching the Hartley family history, spending countless hours in the local library, poring over old newspapers and town records. What I found chilled me to the bone. The Hartleys weren't just any wealthy family. They were involved in something dark, something that the papers of the time only hinted at in vague terms. There were rumors of occult practices, of children going missing in nearby towns. And at the center of it all was Edgar Hartley, the family patriarch. From what I could piece together, Edgar had been obsessed with the idea of immortality. He had traveled the world, studying ancient texts and obscure rituals. When he returned to Willow Street, he was a changed man. That's when the disappearances started. The official story was that the entire Hartley family, Edgar, his wife, and their three children, died of influenza in the winter of 1891. 
but I found whispers of a different tale. Of screams heard coming from the house on a moonless night. Of lights in the attic windows enchanting in an unknown language. The more I uncovered, the more I felt drawn to the house. It was like it was calling to me, revealing its secrets one by one. I started spending more time there long after my official work hours were over. I'd sit in the rooms for hours, waiting, watching, listening. And then one night everything changed. I was in the attic again, drawn there by the persistent feeling that I was on the verge of understanding something crucial. The rocking chair was still, but I could feel a presence in the room, watching me. I know you're here, I said aloud, surprised by the steadiness of my own voice. I want to understand. What happened in this house? For a long moment there was only silence, then a whisper so faint I thought I might have imagined it. He's still here. A chill ran down my spine. Who? Edgar. The temperature in the room plummeted. I could see my breath misting in front of me. The whisper came again louder this time, seeming to come from everywhere at once. He never laughed. He's waiting. He's always waiting. Suddenly, the room exploded into chaos. Every object not nailed down began to levitate. Chairs, boxes, old picture frames. They swirled around me in a vortex of dust and debris. Through the maelstrom, I saw figures taking shape. Translucent, ghostly forms of children, their faces contorted in terror. And behind them, a larger shape was coalescing. A tall, gaunt figure in an old-fashioned suit. As I watched in horror, its features became clearer. Sunken eyes, a wide, leering grin, and hands that ended in long, claw-like fingers. Edgar Hartley. His voice when he spoke was like gravel grinding against my skull. Welcome, my dear. We've been waiting so long for someone like you. Someone to continue my work. I tried to run, but my feet wouldn't move. The ghostly children swirled around me, their whispers growing urgent. Run! You must run! Edgar's form glided closer, those terrible hands reaching for me. You've come so far, learned so much. Join us. Join me. We have such wonders to show you. In that moment, I understood the truth. The house wasn't just haunted. It was a trap. A prison for the souls Edgar had taken in a lure for new victims. And I had walked right into it. With every ounce of will I possessed, I broke free of the paralysis that gripped me. I ran, Edgar's enraged howl following me as I fled down the attic stairs. The entire house seemed to come alive around me. Doors slamming, floorboards buckling, the very walls pulsing like a living thing. I didn't stop running until I was far down Willow Street, the sound of my own panicked breathing drowning out everything else. When I finally dared to look back, I saw the house standing silent and dark once more. But in an upper window, I could just make out a figure tall and thin watching me retreat. I quit the internship the next day, told them I was sick, that I couldn't complete the project. I tried to warn them about the house, but who would believe such a fantastical story? As far as I know, the Hartley house still stands at the end of Willow Street waiting for its next victim. I'm writing this now as a warning. If you ever find yourself in a small town with a house that everyone avoids, a house with a dark history and a bad reputation, stay away. Some doors are meant to stay closed. Some secrets are meant to stay buried. Because sometimes the monsters we tell ourselves don't exist are all too real. And sometimes they're just waiting for someone curious enough or foolish enough to invite them back into the world. I thought I didn't believe in ghosts. Now I know better. There are things in this world that defy explanation. Things that lurk in the shadows of old houses and forgotten histories. And once you've seen them, once you know they're real, you can never truly escape. So if you're ever driving down Willow Street and you see 
an old Victorian house at the end. Keep driving. Don't slow down. Don't look back. Because Edgar Hartley is still there. And he's always waiting for someone new to join his family.